Hello there and welcome to the Dub Zone GA Club podcast. Derek Ryan here. We're going to be looking ahead to Sunday's Senior A hurling final between Kula and St. Bridges over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Later on, we'll also be looking back on last weekend's Senior 1 football quarterfinals. Uh, former Dublin and St. Vincent's man, Ger Brennan, is going to be joining us for that. But first, we're joined on the line by Dublin hurlers Owen O'Donnell and Paul Ryan. Hey, guys. How, How you doing? doing? And uh, here, as always, as well, is the Evening Herald's Conor McKeown. Hey, hey Conor. How's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, Connor. we touched on it last week, I guess, but assessing the championship as a whole, we're down to the last two. Um, a surprising pairing in some ways in that not many people would have predicted uh, Bridges would be, would be in the final. And they're in the final, I guess, on merit. That, it could be a pretty decent final on Sunday. Um, it could be. Or <laughs> Kula could win uh, quite easily. Um, um, like is that more win. what you're looking at? You're more what you're predicting? Yeah, it kind of is, you know. Um, just the more and more you see it cooler, the more and more impressive that they are. Um, and just looking at it there, you know, I think with Mark Schutte back, I think it was only Mark's second game back from the, the injury, the shoulder reconstruction or shoulder uh, operation that he had earlier on in the year that ruled him out for Dublin. I got one three the last day. And, um, you know, when they have everybody fit and firing, I don't know John Shane and, and um, Paul Schutte didn't say the last day, but I think they should be okay for this weekend. Um, what I think it's particularly up front is where Bridges are going to find it difficult because, you know, they have some good man markers, but the way the Kula forwards are moving now, like, like, like before under Matty Kenny, you kind of knew that it was going to be Mark Schutte and it was going to be, um, Conor Callan and what space they were going to occupy, but there seems to be an awful lot more movement with the Kula forwards now. Um, and like the last day, you know, Darrell O'Connell popped up in the full forward position, um, for their second goal against St. Vincent. Um, so, you know, if you take, you know, Bridges do have some good man markers, but if you do go man to man with them and, and you follow them all over the pitch, you can have some defenders find themselves in, in parts of the pitch that they're not that accustomed to. Um, and if you don't go man to man and you try and keep men back, they can kill you from out the pitch because there's so many good hurlers. So, um, it'll just be interesting to see what Bridges do there, whether they do try and keep men back or if they, if they go man to man and trust their man markers. Because if they do that, like you'll see, it's kind of a, a Kind of a rotation of the of the Kula forward line, particularly the inside forward line, who are all very comfortable playing for the rest of the pitch. So, yeah, like it's hard to look past Kula at the moment because I think, you know, like I was watching even the Clare hurling final last weekend, and like it's hard to see a team in the country at the moment, a club team that has the range and sort of variety of attackers that, that Kula do. Um, guys, we've been too positive in suggesting it could be a pretty decent final. Are you expecting it to be as? As lopsided as obviously Connor does. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's hard to know. Um, I think Bridges have surprised everyone in in getting this far, and I think Bridges will fancy themselves for another surprise. But I think Connor's right that the the sense throughout the county at the moment is that Kula are just too strong, and they're a county team in their own right. And the biggest headache for Johnny McGurk going into this game, I think, is that decision whether to play the sweeper an extra man or to go man on man. Because it's kind of a catch-22 situation that if you play the sweeper, you have that little bit of extra in the cover, but then you're leaving someone like Sean Moore or Paul Shute free at the other end, and that's a position these lads excel in. So I wouldn't envy Johnny McGurk and the headache he's going to have over the next coming week. Um, like Connor touched on the forwards that Kula have are just probably a level above what Bridgets would normally be dealing with and what they face against Crave and... Uh, with previous opposition so there's four or five key men there that can do serious damage and I just don't think Bridget's have the backs to cope with all four or five of them that they might be able to shut down Con or Mark on a good day but then Jake Malone or Sean Tracy Nicky Kenny all these lads are, are going to step up to the plate then uh, Paul I mentioned last week I think um, I was talking to Connor and Con- uh, I, I suggested that being underdogs would uh, would suit Bridget's coming into this game um, but he said they're underdogs for a very, very big reason, and that's because Kula are going to uh, win the win the final. Obviously, he's reiterated that point yeah. this afternoon. Uh, your your yeah. your view on that? Um, yeah, look, I, I suppose I'd have to agree with the guys in in some sense that it's very hard to see Bridget having in, having it in the tank to to get past Kula. You know, the, he mentioned the movement. It's that's one thing I noticed about them this year. We played them in the league final and you have Daryl O'Connell coming from midfield. He'll make a cutting run through, but then he'll stay in full forward line. Con will pull out. 
Tracy pulls out, everyone's moving. It's it's extremely hard to mark them. Um, and you'd want to be, if you're going to go man-to-man, you'd want to make sure you have a lot of athleticism in your team um, to be able to cover the ground. Um, and uh, as O'Donnell was saying there, you know, if if you do if you do hold your ground, well, then you're just giving the, the those cooler guys, you know, the space to just pop it over. Like Tracy can put it off from anywhere. Um, you know, Sean Moore must sit in that free roll. So, yeah, it's, 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 I wouldn't envy them at all now if I, you know, trying to come up with a game plan. But at the same time, um, you know, whether Kula tried to eliminate complacency or not, you know, you never know in the day. But do do Bridges have the firepower? I don't know. Like, they have good guys now and Dunn and Paul Winters and Keanu you know, Sullivan there playing well. But, you know, Kula have five or six of those guys and they gel really well together. Um. So yeah, it's 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 very difficult to see past Cooler. Um, Connor, is the way uh, the Cooler play now um, with the, under Willie Marr, uh, like how different is it? To, you, you you kind of touched on it there, but how different is it to the way the Maddie had the had the guys playing? And also, is it impressive? Uh, how impressive is it to you that he's managed to kind of change it and into some 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 sort of free flowing attack that they have in such a short space of time? Yeah, there has been there has been some evolution of the team. There will be more to come because, like as Paul said, yeah, they won the league this year, but they did it without, I think, seven or eight players that were involved. Yeah. With the problem, um, you know, and one involved with footballers on as well. So from now on, I think you'll probably see the evolution of this school of team, um, probably accelerate. But um, like they were very systematic and matty, uh, because that's what really suited them. Like when they got when they left two men inside in a lot of space. They were able to cut teams apart when they got a good bit of ball. But now, like as like as, as Paul was kind of explaining, you know, fellas, I'm sure it's still quite as systematic, but it, it maybe looks a little bit looser because fellas are popping up in different positions um, from the ones that they're occupying at the very start of the game. So, like even the one with Khan playing at centre forward the last day against uh, Vince, that really threw Vince because they Moss Connolly dropped back as a sweeper to try and counteract him, um, and then he didn't really know whether to go to Con and mark him that far out the pitch as a double marker or whether to actually work as the sweeper. So, you know, they have that versatility because um they're so they're so sort of talented, you know, like all those cool players can play in pretty much any of the front six positions. Um, and the other thing as well is as a team they've won two All Ireland and three Dublin County Championships. So um I think probably Changing how they played even slightly under Willie Marr has suited them and has seen them maybe blossom into maybe not into a better team because they were you know a serious team when they won their two All Irelands under Matty but probably you know to, to get the to get the levels of sort of enthusiasm and everything else back into the team like they look like it's fresh again um, uh, now mm. partly I think that's down to the fact that everybody's fit again or close enough to it but. No, there there definitely is some evolution of that, of that style from two years ago. Um, Owen, uh, you've been watching Bridges in action in uh, for Dubs TV over the past few weeks in the quarter final and the semi final and their wins at Parnell Park. We've already touched on Kula, obviously, and their strengths, which are pretty much all over the park. Um, but tell us how Johnny McGurk has Bridges playing and where their big threats are this weekend. I think Paul mentioned them already. The likes of Keen O'Sullivan, Paul Winter's own Dunn. Uh, where can Bridget's look at in terms of their strengths this weekend to give them a chance of winning? Yeah, I think it's important to say as well, like because we're highlighting Kula's strengths, um, that's not taken away from Bridget's strengths because they have an awful lot of potential in their team as well. Um, Johnny McGurk seems to have the balance right between experience and youth. You have like lads in the spine like Alan Nolan and Dara Plunkett who have been around a long time and have been playing together a long time, so no, they're set up very well. And then mixed with that, you have Owen Dunn, Paul Winters, Keno Sullivan, who will probably be the three standout forwards there in the, the Bridget's line. And that's who they will be looking to um, to lead them on on uh, at the weekend. Um, Owen Dunn was probably potentially one of the players in the championship, championship so far. Uh, he's really exploded onto the scene. Um, John, it, it's not just... Uh, Score and ability, he seems to be an all-round player that he's winning puck outs. He's kind of dropping deeper as a centre forward and creating plays, but well able to turn the wheels on when he wants and and put some pace through the middle. So 
these are the lads that they are going to be looking towards uh, on Sunday. But as we said already, that Kula are going to drop their half forward line and will not only have that space to, to put the ball out in front. And as outright ball winners over Darrow Flynn, Sean Morn, Ushin Goff and Paul Shooter, I don't know if if they are that yet, but they're really a team that's grown into the championship so far. And we spoke about Kula getting better. Uh, Bridget's have certainly seen a massive improvement since the start that I think Kula best Bridget's by nearly 20 points in the in the group stage. And Bridget's sure as hell won't let that happen again, that they've grown to a different team. Uh, yeah, I guess the question for you all, guys, uh, has this been coming from Bridget's over the past few years? Uh, like, have you seen the, have you seen them kind of gradually build towards something that they're in a, a deservedly in the county final now this season? Is that something that you kind of, you, you were aware that this is going to be happening from them over the past few years? Or is it a big surprise that they're in the final, Paul? I think it's uh, something that we've seen coming, but probably maybe not as quick as I thought it would come. Like they, I think this year they've just really gelled well together. Johnny McGurk is obviously doing great work with them. Um, we played them, I think it was last year in the league final. And um, they they were quite good, like, but, but this year they've just been been uh, much better than they used to be you know so I think all the guys up front are starting to gel um, and right back into the into the full back line but Noli you know Noli in the spine is a big one there like he'd be talking to them he could be, he, he'd be commanding the hallway they set up and um, so to have that experience there as O'Donnell said um, is, is massive for that team I think if, if you said at the start of the year if they'd been a county final you probably would say that they were playing above themselves but I think they've kind of grown into the role that against Nafina, they were operating at 75, 80%, and that was enough to get over the Nafina team, who, again, is probably a team that we saw more coming through the ranks. Uh, but Bridges got over them, used the momentum, and then had uh, a, a very, very impressive performance against Crave Kieran and, and grew that small bit more. So they are peaking at the right time, and that's whether that's a planned thing from Johnny McGurk or that's just the experience of two close championship games like that. Um, but, like, I'd say Johnny McGurk is he's a, a good man for the mental side of things. I'd say there's going to be things up in the dressing room and they're going to have a siege mentality going into this weekend that nobody gives them a chance and that you know their backs are against the wall and they're going to come out fighting that they won't be lying down for a second. And I think Cooler are mature enough to avoid that pitfall, as, as Paul said earlier on, that no matter what you say or do, it can be very difficult to get rid of that complacency. But... You know, this Kula team have been here and done it before and their ambition moves a lot further past a, a county final here. I think they'll be looking to be involved uh, in the later stages of the All-Ireland and I think that is probably more motivation than anything that they're going to go out. And the other important thing that I was looking at the programme from the last day and Kula are such an inter-county team in their own right that they have 17, 18 lads pushing for places, which is actually quite rare for a club team that there's nobody really nailed on to start. You have lads like Nicky Kenny that wasn't supposed to start the last day, but did start and was probably arguably one of the top three players of the game. You have lads like Michael Conroy, who was on the under-20 team, started midfield, and he's not starting. So there's massive Ross Tierney in the backs. There's massive competition for places in every line of the pitch. So that gives training a lift. That makes William Mars' job a lot easier because it brings that natural intensity to it. Um, so the, they're just a, a massively strong team in their own right. And I know we're, we're heaping a lot of praise on them, but teams <laughs> like this don't come out around too too often. I agree with, with Owen there. Like they're, they're so professional in every sense of the word. Like I'm because myself and Owen would be with a lot of those guys with Dublin. You'd see how they're drilled. Like even when we were playing them this year, the guys that are on the sideline, uh, they're not just standing there either just because they're not in the pitch. They're they're running, they're doing sprints, they're they're getting their their steps in essentially um, and making sure that their fitness is, is right up to the level if they're needed or if they, you know, everybody's pushing for a place. So the question is with Bridget is, are they going to go out to try and hold them and play that sweeper or are they going to have a, have a right cut at it? Um, so yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what way McGurk sets up. And Connor, like that, we've been talking. The lads been talking about about Kula and how and how you know professional that, that they they train and all that kind of thing. But like, where has this come from for the past five years? I mean, it's, it's probably a very difficult question to answer. But like, like five year, five six years ago, w was this building again for 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 Kula that they would be in a position that they'd be winning county finals left, right, and centre, and obviously going on to win all Ireland's? 
is it just a freak generation of players? Like, where, where have you seen this kind of success from Kula come from over the past five years? Uh, it's probably a freak generation of players, but it's a few other things. Like, a, you know, the, you know, a lot of that, old, a lot of that team, um, had, had like fathers who were on the last Kula team, they won three double titles in a row, like the Gracie, uh, the, like the whole of the obviously the relations with the two great clubs. Um, so, like, they're, yeah, there are a bit of a kind of a freak generation as well, because, like, you have to put it into context, you know, like, if Kula were to go on in the All Ireland this year, might be a little bit disrespectful to talk about it before a Dublin County final, but they are the bookies' favourite. Like three All Ireland in four years, like that's kind of that's, that's incredible. Hell, like, no, that, that's that's yeah. like, you know, let, let, more than once in a two generations of the team. So there's a few things that's gone into it, Derek. First of all, there's a really good group of players that have come along at the same time that have grown up together and have a tremendous sort of uh, intuition when they play with each other on the pitch. But they've always been incredibly well managed. Like it's hard to underestimate. Um, I'm sure that the lads will jump in at any second now and speak with Matty Kenny whenever they want. But it's hard to underestimate uh, just how well Matty had that team drilled. Like he he turned them from what they were, which is a team of really talented, but probably just lacking a small bit of direction. Um, as a group, he turned them into a really solid team. Um, and like to have leaders through the team. Like Paul Shute is a huge leader back there, as is Ushin Goff. John Moran, you know, at a time when he wasn't even a Dublin regular, probably became the best for a baller in Dublin. Um, like the huge creativity in Sean uh, Tracy and Jake Malone. You look at a fellow like Colin Cronin, who hasn't played for Dublin uh, probably since 2014 or 2015, and his ability to just break the line and get a goal. Um, and then Mark Shute, Dave Tracy, and particularly Colin Callan. I know people are probably sick, particularly Dublin Hurling people are probably sick of listening to how great Colin Callan is. They might get a look at him anytime soon, but like when he comes into the team, you turn a, an excellent team into an almost unbeatable team. Like, I, like I don't know how you mark him. Like he plays full forward, and you know he goes through the sweep for a shortcut and the goal. He plays centre forward, and he can score from out the pitch despite the fact that he barely held the hurl in his hand for the last seven or eight months. So, um, like when you build all those factors in together, you get what is. Just yeah, and guys, like obviously you you played against them for the last while. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing it's a, it's a similar kind of uh, feeling from from your from your point of view, being the opposition to Kula, that there seems to be this kind of incredible machine. Yeah, I think it's a machine that grows the more you feed it as well. That the more professionalism and the more experience you put in that team, they just they're the type of lads that eat it up. And you know, they they got obviously an excellent coach, Manny Kenny's record speaks for itself. And they took all they had to learn from him and then Willie Marr coming in and they've now pushed it on another another couple of percent. And that's just a credit to the type of lads that they have there that, you know, you could have Maddie Kenny with several clubs teams in Dublin and Willie Marr with the same teams and it probably wouldn't have made as big an impact as they have in Kula. Um, that, you know, the, the fundamental thing in the club is the players and that's what they have in abundance and you know that you can see that they aren't what they're obviously not too willing to let the success go. That you always see them posting nursery, uh, nursery fun days and things in the hall and stuff. That their social media, you can really see that everything is going on behind the scenes and you know it, it's run quite efficiently. And they have obviously lads in charge and who know what they're doing. You know, and it, it's just a machine that is very hard to stop once it gets going. Good stuff. Okay, I guess I don't need to ask for predictions, guys, because it's pretty obvious who you're going for this weekend. But uh, I guess by how much, how big a win do you expect Kula to have this weekend? And do you do you see Bridges putting up a fight to make it into a, into some sort of game at all? Paul, we'll start with yourself. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Look, it's a hard <laughs> one to call. It's a hard one to call. I don't want to be too disrespectful, but look, I'll go obviously go for the Kula win. Um, by I don't know. It's going to be. We'll call it five or six, probably being conservative. Okay, good stuff, Owen. Yeah, as much as I want to agree with Paul, I think it'd be slightly more. This Kula team is is ruthless, and uh, like a, a key theme throughout their games is that they've gone for goal every chance they get, and they've almost tried to force it on occasions. And I just, with no disrespect to Bridget, they've had a fantastic season, and I say if you offered it to them at this time of the year, they would have taken it. But I'd say it'd be closer to to in around the ten points mark, if if not more that. Kula could run away with it. 
And Connor, finally. I suppose I'll take somewhere in between the two lads. Look, it, depends on, <laughs> Go Go it, it depends on it depends on how well Kula starts, you know. Um like the first ball Connell Callan gets, you can be sure, sure that he's going to go. And you could make an argument to say that if Bridget start well, they could still be very much in the game at half time and then the second half takes on a different complexion. But like Vincent's got a goal with her first ball in the semi final and then Kula went and scored two goals directly afterwards. So um I suppose it depends on how far they, ahead they go early on in the game. Um, but I think, what did you do last day? What, six or seven. Okay, guys, thanks a million for joining us. And just a reminder that Sunday's Dublin Senior A hurling final will be shown on TG Cahar. It's deferred coverage of the game. The game is on at four o'clock at Parnell Park. You can watch it on TG Cahar from 20 to 6. Thanks, guys. Coming up next, we're going to be chatting football with Ger Brennan. OK, we're going to turn our focus now to the football and last weekend's Dublin Senior 1 football uh, quarterfinals. Connor has stayed on the line. Hi, Derek. And joining us to look back on those games is former Dublin and St. Vince's man, Ger Brennan. Hi, Derek. Hi, Connor. OK, good stuff. Uh, just a reminder of the semi-finals the, from the quarterfinals at the weekend. Bally Bowden St. Andes versus St. Jude's. Thomas Davis versus Kimmelko Croaks uh, are the uh, semi-final pairings after the result of the weekend. Bally Bowden beating the FINA. St. Jude's beating... Uh, St. Vincent's, Thomas Davis beating Castlenock and Croaks beating Clontarf uh, over the weekend. Uh, Connor, I guess we'll start with yourself and uh, your overall assessment of the last four teams in the competition. Are they all deserving of being there after the weekend and what did you make of the games in general? Well, the big surprise, I think, is is Thomas Davis being in the last four. Um, you know, they were B champions last year and it's a, you know, it's a fair step up from the B championship to the A championship. Um, and I think Castlenock are one of those teams that have performed really well in the last few years. Like they topped that group, they beat Vincent back in April, um, and I thought that they would probably win that game. So I think that they're the big surprise. If there's a team that are possibly lucky to be there, you could make an argument that it's Bally Bowden St. Enders because they were, you know, had Nafina taken that goal chance just on the stroke of half time in extra time, they might have found it hard to come back from four points down. And Nafina will obviously have regrets. Um, and recriminations about what happened to Conor McHugh um, when he got that second yellow card after being dragged to the ground by Declan O'Mahony just on the stroke of full time. So, you know, that's one of the, that's probably the team that could be most lucky to be in the semi final with Bradley Bowden. The, uh, one of the big talking points, I think, has to be the how easy Jude's had it against Vincent. Um, well, you know, last week I think we were all pretty split as to how that game would go, but I don't think anybody really saw. Jude's being so much better than Vincent, and Vincent's being so poor. So, um, you know, that was a huge talking point, and I think it was a very commanding display from Jude's. Um, in hindsight, I think they're probably an even better version of the team uh, that last year got to the county final. Um, you know, they're they're hugely organised, and they're probably the last team on earth that Vincent wants to play, um, because you know they're big and structured, uh, and their movement is very preordained, and they're very well drilled. Um, and when they ran a Vincent in the second half, Vincent lost their discipline and gave away needless plays. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you, Connor. And watching the St. Vincent's lads having played with them for a long time, I kind of felt for them out in the field. We, we, we kind of lacked direction, lacked purpose in our attack. And as you mentioned, Connor, St. Jude's are such a, an organised and structured team and, and they know what they're about. and they certainly have improved on their all round gameplay uh, since last year when they lost the county final. Uh, while there was only, I think, maybe it was there eight points difference on the, on the on the scoreboard. It was nine points last year, but I think it could have been twenty points if if, if you was really put us to the sword. So yeah, feel for feel for the St. Vincent's players, but uh, possibly the writing was on the wall um, with some of the performances earlier on in the year. Uh, for St. Vincent's we were just a bit uh, unstructured and, and, and never would have on occasion and um, Jared, going into the game would you because last week the guys were pretty split about what would happen in this game this was kind of the one game that they weren't sure about they predicted Bally Bowden to win they predicted um, Castle Knock to beat uh, Thomas Davis but this was the one game that they said would be uh, very very tight were you I guess going into the game wary about what would happen in the game were you, were you confident that Jews would win well, based on our performances in the championship over the last six seasons, Derek, you are hoping that there's enough experience and muscle memory uh, and mental memory to, to get ourselves uh, out of the hole. 
and get through this uh, quarter final against St Jude's. But probably in more recent times and recent games, uh, um, just watching St Vincent's, there was a lot of positional changes throughout the year, and I suppose the management were trying new new things, um, putting guys in uh, different areas of the field. Ultimately, it came back to a more known structure or um, position on the field for us, Derek, with the uh, the usual guys playing the usual positions. But again, we just was a despirited, uh, disjointed performance from from uh, from St. Vincent's and and other players. Uh, haven't tried to a couple of them since. Just feel disappointed with uh, then with their own performance, but probably a year as a whole while we're still in the. Uh, semi-final stages of the of the Division One league, um, that league position may be covering a couple of cracks that exist within the squad at the moment. Um, and tell me, if, you know, we, we spoke last week about the fact that uh, you know, Jude's would for straight Vincent's. That obviously turned out to be the case because I think uh, Vincent's went two points up after six minutes and scored two more points for the rest of the game. So in the last fifty-four minutes of the game, they scored two points, and obviously one of them came in the last minute when they were. Eight points down to bring it down to seven uh, in the end. From a Jews' perspective, their game plan worked pretty well because they frustrated Vincent, stopped them from creating a whole lot, certainly in the second half. Well, the the funny thing is, Derek, just looking at some of my notes here from the game, in, in that first half period, we missed two goal chances. Uh, Massey had an off day with his own strike, and uh, he missed four in the first half, and Dermot also missed one. And actually, Adam Baxter missed another shot, so we missed all in all two two six, uh, in the first half period, despite not playing particularly well. And if those scores go in early on, the team can gather a bit of momentum and and a bit of confidence. But alas, it didn't. And I know when we were chatting last week, you know my initial uh, preview uh, in 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 looking at how uh, Jude's perform, Derek is you can't let them get a lead on you. Because they play so defensively, uh, they get numbers um, back, and they do break our pace too. In fairness, but um, it's very hard to break them down when they have a lead, and they're just so well versed now and experienced that kind of keeping the ball and and uh, just sucking the life out of opposition once they have a lead on you. And uh, fair play to St Jude's because they did that extremely effectively after the initial five ten minutes. They kind of got a stranglehold in the game, and it was probably only one winner after ten minutes in my eyes. And Connor, I guess the writing was on the wall. Uh, as Jer mentioned there, you don't give uh, Jews a lead and, and the writing was on the wall. There were 5-3 up at the break, but by a, a few minutes into the second half, it was you know 7-8-3 very, very quickly. into the. It, it seemed it seemed kind of like they, they picked up a big lead kind of out of nowhere. Suddenly they were five or six points ahead, certainly from my point of view at least. W- was the game over pretty much with 15, 20 minutes to go, 50 minutes to go at least when, when it looked like um, you know they had that big lead? And again, you can't give Jews certainly any sort of lead, let alone a big lead. Yeah, but like as you said, like Vince went two points up at the very start, and and as Gary outlined, they had a lot of chances to kind of, you know, put up a better score at half time. Um, like it wasn't a case of Jews got the first goal or scored three or four points on the trot, and then Vincent was chasing it. Like it was, like it, like Vincent were kind of being nearly dispirited by their own play as much as. How Jude's were playing, like the Jude's keep the ball really well. Their kick pass and kind of mid range kick pass was very accurate. Like if you remember as well, I think Kevin McManaman had three wides and another drop short into the keeper's hands mm-hmm. in the first half. Um, now we obviously had a big influence on the game, and particularly in the second half. But like Jude's had their chances as well. But a lot of the Jude's movements seem to be pretty well orchestrated. Um, whereas if you look at the se- in the second half, you know Darren McConley was getting the ball sort of 65 yards out in the centre forward position but because Jude's keep their structure so well like it's, it's so it's impressive to watch how diligent they sort of make sure that all the positions are being manned like Jeremy McConley was forced to kind of kick these low long balls but then you had they were kind of into the corners so you had Mossy Quinn and uh, kind of Varley kind of scampering into the kind of fam line you know and even if you win it out there you have to go through a wall of bodies to, to get a shot out so you know th- when you come up against a team like Jude, like one of the things that can kind of break them down is, you know, a moment of genius or several moments of genius, uh, prefer- preferably. But uh, usually what you need to do is to have a very fine and orchestrated game plan in advance. And if Vincent had that um, breakdown, that they didn't, they did it very well. It was very hard to protect. 
and, and it's probably something Connor that St Vincent's we would have had over the last 10 years uh, when we were kind of competing at semi-final final stages was that uh, the fine structure defensively and offensively um, also a lot of clarity in terms of roles and what, what, and what players were supposed to be doing and what was admirable about St Jude's which you alluded to already is everyone had an understanding of what was expected of them uh, if they were a wing forward who found themselves covering the middle part of the pitch they still had an understanding of what was required uh, of them and I thought what they did very well with with with, with their image, Chris Cookian tied ish to him and, and Mark Sweeney dropping into the space behind Chris. It was it was a very unlikely that we were gonna get a, a run on them, uh, straight down uh, the middle. And then the quality of ball, as Connor mentioned, Eric into the into the corner. Oh, sorry, into the corners. You're not gonna get a hold off from them. Uh, Saint Jude's and our kickouts I thought were excellent in what they did. They did to uh, and Vincent's what Kerry did to Dublin in the Braun All Ireland final, where they committed nearly seven guys inside the opposition forty five yard line, forced the ball along and get bodies numbers around the break. And I think they won the one the vast majority of uh, of kickouts that we did improve in the second half, but the last was too late. And where to now for Vincent's Jer? Because uh, it was a it's a big defeat. Like, can they recover from this next year? I mean, they've obviously got a lot of guys in the team who are still All Ireland winners from a few years back. I mean, do they need fresh blood, or what? What do they need to do now to compete for next year? Well, again, with any big defeat, Derek, there has to be a lot of self reflection from players and from management and from everyone involved, and there needs to be an honest look at how fellas prepared again on the field and off the field and how management went about their own business too and guys need to ask themselves is this something that they really want to do and are they up to it uh, because we do have a very strong pedigree there and a lot of all Ireland and county medals uh, still within the squad so we haven't become a bad team overnight it's just last, la- lacked a bit of direction in my view looking at it but there's a lot of honest questions and hard conversations that need to be have had over the, the next couple of weeks and you know, we can't lose the momentum of the last couple of years. Good stuff. Um, okay, I guess the you, you mentioned already, Connor, the best game or the big game of the weekend was on Saturday night, was live on RTE, it was Bowden against Nafina. Bowden coming through it eventually. I think they won by two goals, 3.15 to 1.15 from memory uh, was the final score. Um, a really great game. So many talking points out of it. Uh, you mentioned, Connor, that Nafina possibly could feel uh, hard done by not coming out of it because of some of those... Uh, it, it contentious decisions which we'll talk about in a second but even some of the key moments in the game for example Rob McDade's block at the end of uh, the first half of uh, extra time was such a key moment obviously Nafina scored their goal first in the game it looked like maybe they might be able to see the game out before before uh, Bascal scored scored uh, the, goal, the late goal for Bowden to bring them back into it so a lot of key moments in the game went Bowden's way and I guess Nafina could feel very hard done by coming out of that game at the end of it uh, that they're not into the semi-final. Yeah, well, they'll have huge regrets. Um, huge regrets. Some of them are their own making and some of them aren't. Um, like the goal stand, again, like it was a really well worked move. Um, and you just, if you look at it again, I think it's, it's again, O'Reilly had the ball in his hand. So he kind of, if he delayed the pass, maybe a second longer, but then the, the receiver could have had the option of actually just hamming the ball into the back of the net. But as it was, he had kind of had to catch it. Um, and then take a shot, and it gave Robbie McDade the chance. And it was a brilliant block, so like I mean, you shouldn't take anything away from Robbie McDade's block. It was a, it was a brilliant play and a brilliant defensive play. Um, but I do think if Nafina had gone four up, um, it could have been hard for Bally Bowden to get back into it because yeah, Bally Bowden won by six, but like their, you know, their last goal was a, was a goal on the break. Um, but like it was a great night for Bally Bascal, like it seems to be really exemplary, but the. You know, it's the, I think the red card to Conor McHugh that got an awful lot of kind of traction online. A lot of people were very upset about it. Um, and I think you're in a feeling you feel slightly hard done by in that situation because, you know, if the letter of the law was being followed, I think Declan O'Mahony should have been black carded. Um, and Fina got a free. And okay, to be fair to the rest, by the time he turned around, all he could see was two people rolling around wrestling with each other. But the linesman was quite close to it. So, you know, it does happen a lot. We see it, uh, particularly in the inter-county games, where 
the aggressor in that situation um, doesn't get any sort of extra punishment as to the player who reacts. You know, those those couple of moments of the two that they'll probably rule. Yeah, I, I again I agree with Connor. Not to be rubbing all your points, Connor, <laughs> but uh, uh, he's seen the game very similar to me. To maybe look at the Conor McHugh incident, firstly, what I will say about officials is that we do need officials uh, in place in order to play these games. I, I I would raise a question over sometimes the maybe the standard of of a uh, of refereeing on occasion. Um, in this particular uh, case. Barry Tiernan, the referee, I was actually standing on the same side of uh, of the sideline official who communicated with Barry Tiernan, uh, the Declan O'Mahony and Conor McHugh incident. Barry Tierney was, was watching where he was supposed to be watching and this was developing behind him on the 45-yard line and under the instruction of the linesman, he gave Conor McHugh a second yellow card and I just think it was an awful decision. Uh, again, I would have said on the night, with the covers that was there, Derek and Connor, that Declan Mahoney did what I have done before and would have done myself, and Freddie McMahon and the night with me as well. We both agreed that um, you just do these things. It's, cynicism is part of, uh, of of sport, and that that's one of the things that goes on. But the real cop out for officials at inter county level and at club level is booking two fellas. Like, how often do you see forwards actually dragging back to the ground? The only time forwards put a bit of a press. On the backs is if it's our kick out, they might be nudging and pushing a small bit, which is good. But the forwards, uh, by their nature, aren't um, uh, instinctively aggressive. Derek Connor, so for Connor McHugh to get the second yellow card there, I actually thought it was an awful decision. And again, no more than players looking at themselves after games. I think referees should be and linesmen reviewing um, their decisions with the view of uh, of improving uh, their own quality going into the semi-finals, wherever games they are involved in uh, afterwards. So that'll be the first big uh, talking point from the game for me. The second thing, Derek, uh, would be Ryan, uh, sorry, Collie Basquell. I thought the longer the game went on, uh, Collie would have been in UCD. I uh, would have played a small bit with him in my latter years with Dublin. He's an extremely fit individual. Any of the fitness tests that he would have been part of over the years, he's always to the fore. And again, the longer game progresses the more that column as well needs to be watched and in fairness to Johnny Cooper and Owen Merchant who as Dublin players coming back into the Nafina setup they were excellent against Ballymun previous round and I thought they were close to excellent second the last night out as well against Ballybow and St Enders they just took their eye off the ball a small bit with Collie Basquell um, in the latter stages of the extra time and again with Collie's fitness his power output it wouldn't drop too much from the start of a game to the end of the game and that's where he is most lethal and then you got to commend the quality of his finishing I thought the quality of his finishing was excellent in, uh, in how he stroked the ball into, into the net and his pointing taken as well and then the third thing for me a talking point in the game was the Fina's inability to put goal chances away I think that's what caught them they did kick some lovely scores in the first half and just looking at my notes here they had the ball in the first half of normal time inside Bally Bowden's and then 45 yards line 14 times but they only came away with 8 scores so they are missing goal chances uh, Connor did mention uh, James Doran's missed goal chance again no doubt he'd be kicked himself haven't, haven't missed, missed it uh, but he had a super game though as well and again I agree with Connor that Glenn Royal just another couple of steps forward he, he would have really fixed or committed the goalkeeper uh, to Glenn and it would have been a simple Pam goal but Again, it's easy being the hurt on the ditch and reviewing the game uh, in, in, in real time. The split decisions that define uh, uh, success and, and in this case, but a failure in the scoreline, a very successful year for Desi Farrell and the lads uh, involved, but uh, just not quite uh, at the level just yet. The red card for Conor McHugh was one of the big talking points. Um, there's another red card that was quite contentious over the weekend. That was Jack McCaffrey's on... Uh, Sunday, contentious for some people, not for other people. People, Some people, it was a high tackle, so a lot of people felt it was a deserved red card. Others disagreed. Your view on that, and how big a part did that play in Croke's win? Because before that, Paul Mannion had just come off the bench at half time, kicked a couple of quick scores to put Croke's ahead. So were Croke's kind of on the upper curve anyway? Do you feel that the red card 
played a massive part in the result or even with Jack on the pitch would Croaks have come away with the win? Um, like I think Croaks were going to win the game anyway but like well, we were deprived an exciting finish to the game because Jack McCaffrey was sent off was it deserved? I don't know it was definitely borderline I think he gave the referee a decision to make you know in a situation like this temptation is always to say well he's not that sort of player and I know that that's not really in Jack's repertoire but whether the offence warranted the red card or not, and it was probably high enough that, that you know there was a question mark over. Um, but it's a shame because it was a good game up until then, and folks hadn't had it all their own way. And as I said, they had to bring Paul Mannion off the bench. Um, I think it might have been only a point in it um, by the time Jack was sent off, and I'm not sure that Tim Park scored after that. But um, you know, Croaks definitely had like if you take scoring chances as being the sign of a team and its superiority generally, I think. Folks might have had 27 shots on the day, and has got 15 scores off that. So, um, you know, the conversion rate wasn't hectic, but um, yeah, like, I suppose, and it's a player of Jack McCaffrey's um, uh, caliber and sort of standing in the game and influence on the team, and they lose to him. It's, it's always going to have a huge bearing on the game. Of course, it'll be that game, which looks like against expectations, is going to be a really competitive one. Yeah, uh, Jack was he put off four minutes in the second half. John Tarf being one point up, seven six at half time, and Paul Manning did come in there, like you mentioned, and kicked a superb free with his first possession on the forty five yard yard line. Slightly the wrong side of the post for left footer, and he kicked another ball from the same distance out on the good side for left footer, and then Jack got his red card. For me, what was disappointing for John Tarf as a whole was nearly from 1 to 15 and the subs that came in they just lost all sense of belief in themselves as individuals and as a group and I found it hard to fathom that despite someone of Jack McCaffrey's uh, calibre and being a, a real leader in the squad and once he went off so many players just nearly imploded mentally and probably one example was I thought in the first half Andy Foley number 8 for Clontarf had had a super game and, and himself and Morgan Walsh were nearly dominating the midfield pairing uh, of Craig Diaz and Ben Shovlin for that first half period but once Jack went off they just they lost all, all, all sense of purpose and again were somewhat uh, rudderless the balls that they well their use of possession their decision making uh, in possession they just kind of lost all sort of hope they kicked one score towards the end of the second half um, so finished off 16.8 again I would agree with Connor. Uh, Croaks were only in probably second or third gear in the first half and they didn't get much higher than that into the second half and you always expected them to push on if if they needed to uh, do that and the introduction of Paul Mannion just added that bit of glass um, I think Shane Walsh from Clontar the wing back is, is, is due a good mention I thought he had a superb game and a Looked to be a man marking job on Shane Horn. Bring forward for Dimacook Croak. Shane Horn, watching him the last day uh, against St. Sylvester's in round three of the group, he was playing nearly like the Kieran Kilkenny does for Dublin in, in just being a cog in the wheel, uh, uh, certainly moving the ball forward for Dimacook Croaks and the amount of uh, ball that went through him uh, was extremely high. But Shane Walsh had a superb game on him, with uh, resulting Shane Horn being taken off midway during the second half but look at folks have so much firepower uh, Shane Cunningham there Callum Pearson Pat Burke they only kicked two frees but it's very loose in front of the goal and then he introduced uh, Paul Mannion then as well you know they're taking off a lot of watching so when you think you have one or two of their key guys um, covered all of a sudden a couple of other fellas are, are, are popping up and putting balls uh, over the bar Croaks will have to up their game going into the semi final. I know you're chatting with that next week, but they, 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 I don't think they'll get away with um, the lack of luster uh, kind of second gear, third gear performance that they displayed against Glantarf. Uh, they won't get away with that, I don't think, against Thomas Davis the next day. Yeah, and finally, uh, looking at that Thomas Davis result, last but not least, because it was the shock of the weekend. Like I say, last weekend uh, or last week on the podcast, Connor, you were. Uh, right in so far as uh, going for the uh, three of the four teams that qualified Bowden 
uh, St. Jude, well, St. Jude's and, and, and Vincent's was touch and go, Croaks. But Thomas Davis was kind of the outlier. Um, a lot of people uh, predicted Kalsenok to go through. How impressed were you by Thomas Davis at the weekend? Yeah, really impressed. Like, if you look at it from the Kalsenok point of view, I think Jerry McDermott Rowe got five points. Uh, Tommy McDaniel got one, two, three legs. Fiona Kenny and Shane Bowling got three points each. Like, if I gave you these scores beforehand, you'd say that's probably in line with Kalsenok winning. But like what we didn't see was Thomas Davis' ability to open up Castle Knox, which they did. Like that period where we had three goals in the space of it, maybe seconds, it was kind of chaotic football at the start. I heard a clip where Jerry was getting very excited there in the commentary booth um, when all those goals were piling in. But um, like it, was, it was really, really impressive from Thomas Davis because their movement, you know, when, he, like, suppose when you haven't seen the team a lot, it's hard to kind of. You know, when, when, when you're not kind of expecting something to happen, it's hard to kind of read it. But um, the movement was really good. And, um, they picked out their they picked out their men really well. Like that, Karen Farley was really good. Obviously, on Kirby, you get one five in the end, one three to play. Um, but you know, like three twelve is a good score against Castle Knock. Like they're a good solid team. Um, and like you know, I don't want to go back to the cliche, but it's get three goals in a game like that, particularly two and. Just the possession of Thomas Davis just the other night. You kind of set the tone for the game, um, and Castle Knock, for whatever reason, never really looked like they were going to kind of. Not that they didn't sort of rally, they did. Like a lot of their big players played really well, but I just think Thomas Davis collectively were kind of a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little bit sharper, or a little bit. It's hard to quantify these things. But they were, they were very, they were, they were convincing winners in the end. They were, they were, they were, they were probably hungrier for me, Connor. Over over the course of the sixty odd minutes, you look at the age profile profile of Thomas Davis's and compare it to Castlenock. You know, centre back for Davis's Brian Kirby, thirty eight. Kieran Farrelly, thirty eight. Shane McGrath, who I would have played with some development squads and minor and twenty ones in Dublin over the years, thirty four, thirty five, and. All of those, those three guys all stood up, particularly Shane McGrath in the second half, coming in with three points. And Kieran Farley, using his experience and his body strength, uh, scored 1-1. One, one. But um, Castlenock, Derek, would, would, would play similarly to St. Jude's in, in how they get numbers behind the ball and look to break at pace. But Thomas Davis has just kind of met him head on. They, 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 when they, Thomas Davis did push up, and met Castlenock uh, in their own half. They stopped them building up any momentum. And again, I think they were well worth the one point victory. Uh, they just showed that bit more desire uh, to win. I was at a couple of the county board meetings two years ago when they were redefining uh, the new senior football structure in Dublin with the senior A and senior B. And Thomas Davis is with their tradition of and winning three in a row, I think the late 80s into the 90s, they were quite disappointed and hurt at those county board meetings that they were being placed in a, in a senior B championship. And I can only assume, and the evidence suggests now, that having won senior B last year, they, are, they sat down and made a choice as a group of players to probably you know, give the two fingers, uh, so to speak, to maybe... Uh, county board executive or I don't know well I do think it is a good structure and a good decision from the county board just to get that in there but they have something to prove Thomas Davis's and they proved it and they're really in bonus territory now um, Owen Kirby as, as Connor mentioned I thought was super and Ryan Deegan midfield and as well that uh, was super and then actually Robbie Critty the goalkeeper in the second half he came up to try to stop one and he and he missed it and then a couple of moments later, he got, sorry, in the first half he missed one. A couple of moments later, the second half he came up and, 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 and struck the ball over the bar. I think that might have got him back to the level uh, at that stage in the second half. But again, they just progressed on and they and they held out. But it's 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 amazing what team spirits can do to a team where there's no out and out superstars in comparison to some of the fellas we know in the Castlenock team. But when a group of players sit down and decide that they're going to try something and work hard at it. It's amazing what can happen, and I think you've seen that on, on Sunday afternoon. 
Good stuff, guys. Um, thanks a million for joining us uh, this week. Just a reminder of the semi-final fixtures. Um, you mentioned that Thomas Davis playing Crokes. That's at 7 o'clock in uh, Parnell Park. That's on uh, Saturday week, the 26th of October. Before that, at Parnell Park, it's at a quarter past five. Ballyboden take on St. Jude's on uh, Saturday week, the 26th of October. And uh, just a couple of the senior two fixtures, by the way. Half past one at O'Toole Park on Saturday, 26th. It's Temple Oak, Sing Street versus Whitehall, Calm Kill. Kula versus Round Towers, Lusk at half past three out of Tool Park on Saturday as well. That's Saturday 26th, Saturday week. And a reminder before we go that Sunday's Dublin Senior A hurling final will be shown live on TG Carr. It's deferred coverage of that game. The game is on at four o'clock at Parnell Park. You can watch it on TG Carr from 5.40. That's it for now. Thanks for listening and chat to you soon.